I left half my heart in Fiji. It's still there, and and I regularly think about it. And, and I'm in contact not only with my players still, but many of the staff. I, I, I built a little resort called Funky Fish up there, and um, I'm still involved with some of the staff from the from those days. And uh, yeah, no, I it, I love the place. Bullet everyone. We had the honour and privilege to meet with Brad Johnson. And this is what he had to say about the Fiji rugby team. Thank you so much for uh, agreeing to uh, this interview. Like, you know, it's an absolute great honour. Um, like, you know, just reading about your past, your, um, you were an all black, you paid well over 100 grams for Auckland. Um, Coached Fiji, coached uh, Italy. <laughs> uh, like uh, one of the main questions which a lot of uh, people in uh, Fiji have asked me to ask you is what initially attracted you to coach Fiji? <laughs> uh, initially, I toured Fiji with the New Zealand Barbarians when um, Colin Meads was captain. Yes. I went back there with Auckland and I went back there with the All Blacks in 1980. And I just loved the the place. I just yes. love the people. Um, yeah, everything about it I really enjoyed. And uh, I had an opportunity. I was asked if I'd come up and help the forward pack against Wales about uh, 95. And I came up, and I really enjoyed working with the boys. And uh, they were they were hungry for knowledge. Uh, they had great enthusiasm but unfortunately technically weren't so good and mm -hmm. it just bit me I just uh, love it yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that, that's absolutely awesome um, when you initially started coaching Fiji I'm reading some of the newspaper articles and uh, what the journalists had to say back then um, like the Fiji rugby players weren't, uh, like, you know, apart from technically, uh, had the technical skills, their fitness levels were very low, and uh, Fiji was, uh, like, you know, in the doldrums. <laughs> and uh, uh, what are some of the main challenges that you faced uh, when you started coaching Fiji? I found the general culture in rugby had slipped away. Um, they had a proud, say, 70s era, mm -hmm. and from there, uh, they'd lost their way in Fijian rugby, and I think it, everything was sort of hinging on sevens. Uh, very little input was going into the, the full code, the fifteens code, and they were just floundering a bit. Uh, unfortunately, they'd lost technical, um, what's the word, direction, and they still had the willingness to do it, but but. There was no focus on 15, uh, 15s in any way whatsoever when I got up there. Wow. So uh, I'm guessing what you were trying to do was build up towards the 1999 World Cup when you initially started coaching, am I correct? Yeah, well basically what happened was the second game I was involved with was in Nandi and we beat Samoa for the first time in I think six or seven years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and. Um, the crowd got behind the team yes. strongly and all of a sudden there was a new positive vibe about the possibility that, that Fiji could play 15s again and uh, and from there they asked me if I would join them full time which I accepted with a great honour um, moved up to, in I think it was 96 beginning of 96 and was full-time coach from there on. You know? uh, this game in Nandi, was that the famous game where Joey Lee Bandiri scored? No, no this was a game where oh. Opeti Taruva kicked a goal from halfway. Okay. Um, <laughs> and the crowd just went <laughs> yes. bonkers. And, um, and that was at the time when yes. Samoa were ruling Pacific Rugby and yes. uh, Peter Fatloff you know, and yes. my great mate Brian Williams were yes. involved. You yes. know. Mm -hmm. So it was a good, good start. Oh, absolutely. Um, so, when you were coaching Fiji, like there already was a great disparity between the Pacific Island nations and uh, Tier One nations like Australia, New Zealand, England. Now, looking at it very, very broadly, do you think that disparity has increased or decreased uh, from then till now? <laughs> 
Uh, I think it, it has increased slightly because of the professionalism. Yeah. Unfortunately, uh, the isolation Fiji has from the big competitions in the world yeah. has affected their ability to grow yeah. as, a, as a nation. Yeah. In saying that, yeah. they've obviously got hundreds of players now playing professional rugby all around the world yeah. who are getting trained outside their environment yeah. um, and they have become, what's the word, more professional and stronger individuals yeah. mm -hmm. but it's still very difficult for Fiji rugby on a, a poultry yeah. budget yeah. Mm -hmm. to compete with these greater yeah. nations. So, uh, one of the main things a lot of people say is uh, it's budget, it's money <laughs> and uh, what would you think some of the solutions are to this budgetary problem? Well, for some some reason, the IRB, the World Rugby, have to allow Fiji into some major competitions. Not just Fiji, Samoa and, and Tonga as well. Yeah. Because until they are, they're not going to get some incomes yeah. mm -hmm. that will help keep their best players in, in their country mm -hmm. and develop them for Fiji. Right. Mm -hmm. It's okay having professionals playing away but unfortunately it's always secondary when they come back together for about five days before yep. they play yep. a test, yep. they're undercooked is... compared to other countries. England, New Zealand, they're in camps throughout the year, they're together as a unit yep. the whole year. Yep. Um, Fiji come together five days, play a test yep. and then go apart again. Yep. And then some of them aren't available for the next one and they get another group to come together for five days. Yep. They're always... At, the only time I think Fiji are ever competitive mm -hmm. is at World Cups, when they can go into camp, they can develop, work as, become a team yep. mm -hmm. and a family, yes. mm -hmm. and then they, they show, they have shown regularly at World Cups how they can play the game, but they've pulled apart between. So speaking of World Cup, uh, what do you think of Fiji's chances uh, in this World Cup? Well, they were, they were great last World Cup. I thought they were excellent. Um, I think they've got 26 very competitive players, mm -hmm. but whether, once again, mm -hmm. the unity is going to be there, mm -hmm. it, it's a que big question mark. You know, it's going to be very difficult once again for them. Mm -hmm. um, athletically, mm -hmm. Fijians are second to none. Mm -hmm. It's just systems mm -hmm. and the fellow group thing. New Zealand rugby evolves from year to year to year, yep. keeping the same nucleus together, put it growing, growing, growing slowly. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, Fiji gets ripped apart, yep. comes together, yep. ripped apart, comes together, yep. and it's very, very hard for them to be uh, positive and, and yep. dominant in that situation. Oh, wow. no, th th thank you for that, I mean, you, yeah. you were echoing exactly what a lot of people have said. Um, yeah, but the solutions to this, uh, like, you know, as you said, uh, maybe having Fiji in a major competition. Um. Going back, sorry, to my start, yeah. when I first got there, I found players physically weren't strong enough because they weren't doing weights like the rest of the world war, yeah. well, and were, sorry, and then I found this influence of sevens and fifteens rugby was putting them under huge pressure for the fact that the game is they're two totally different games. You know, Weiss Ali Sarevi was the greatest sevens player in the world. Mm -hmm. But put him in the fifteens field with a whole lot more men there to tackle him, yeah. a whole lot little, less space to run into, mm -hmm. and he, he wasn't the same player. He wasn't able to produce yeah. that, that level again. Yeah. And in those days, I had to go outside of Fiji to find a fly half, for instance, who could dictate a game and, and run a game. It, it was no good just doing chip kicks within your own 22 or, or uh, just flinging the ball away when a big tackler was coming towards you, uh, yeah. as you could in sevens in yeah. those days. Mm -hmm. um, so we, I brought in some expats who had experience, uh, like young Little, Nicky Little, who ended up playing more games for Fiji than any other. Um, Greg Smith, you know, the hooker, uh, Simon so Rai-Louis, mm -hmm. they were professionals in their own fields mm -hmm. and with the mix of the talent of the local boys mm -hmm. and the 
what's with discipline of the expats, yep. we were able to mould a team. It didn't just happen, it happened over five, six years yep. to build that team to the World Cup. And that's what I need. We need in Fiji a regular builder, not yep. just leave it until five months before the yep. World Cup. Yep. It's got to start three years in advance yep. and it's got to be developed all the way through to the World Cup. So, uh, speaking of the current coach, uh, McKee, yes. I mean, he's been there for a good solid five years. And um, what a, Well, what I've got nothing but praise for him because yes. I think he's done a great job. And yes. I, I think, um, that, you know, Fiji has show, showed that yes. recently in their, in their victories. And um, no, and it's great to see that the country's getting behind him, you know. Yeah, I, I um, completely agree. I mean, it's good to see that he's there for five years. I mean, prior to him, I've lost count of uh, there about six or seven coaches before. Yeah, so stability is a big thing. Yes. Mm -hmm. And the players get to trust yep. the coach yep. and get to know the systems. Yep. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, good luck to him for this World Cup because he, um, he deserves a lot of credit. Uh, going back to the World Cup, that 1999 uh, World Cup game against France, <laughs> yeah. Like yeah. Uh, people my generation or so, like we still talk about it and think about it. <laughs> so do I, regularly. <laughs> and that, I used to have it here when we had that World Cup. Now look at it. <laughs> <laughs> Quickly taken by Lamizor. And the pass out to Dominici. And he's in the corner, but was it a forward pass? Well, the try is given. That was a pass, it was definitely forward, it was a mile forward. Now what are they saying? It looks as if they are discounting the try. But re-awarding the penalty. Oh, I just can't work that one out, jump. If they touch it and gone, given a forward pass, then it's a scrum down Fiji ball. Mola, he could be in trouble. Soft try. Oh, and he's given a knock on against the Fijians. Now, I think that's harsh. That just went loose to me on the big tackle. Now, I want to see that again. France now committing suicide. Big hit, spills out. It's got to be a try. Nothing wrong with that. So two very important decisions, both gone France's way. One where they got the re kick for the penalty. And that one was a try. For sure as eggs is eggs. Del Mazzo and Tournaire in their element. Down it goes again. Up goes, up it goes, and a penalty try. He's awarded it against the Fijians. Roars of approval from the crowd. But you have to say, the man who popped out was Del Mazzo in the middle. Yet the French are happy. But it was the French that went up. For me, they popped out. Mr. O'Brien's going to be consistent. It would have to be a penalty to Fiji. Well, I found it's quite hard to sort of fathom where, where Paddy was getting at um, there. He's, he's dished out two yellow cards to both the Fijian props um, for either standing up or collapsing. And then the Del Masso, the hooker, pops his head out and he gives a penalty try which um, I think everyone was sort of quite astounded. Right, I know he's a friend of yours, but the referee, not, not Paddy O'Brien's finest game. Well, I think he would he'd look back on that game, and I, I think he would have learnt um, through the mistakes that, that maybe he did make. And that was a, that was a classic um, error of judgment, I think. And I think the Fijians will, would feel you know, justifiably miffed um, that they were given a, a penalty try against them. Um, <laughs> I mean, the boys played outstandingly. They really did. They, they overpowered... France, you know, Catalao won, I think, seven or eight throws against. And picked off by the Fijians. It didn't get to uh, Fabian Pelusi. Very rangy jumpers. Simon Raiwalui, 6'6", Emori Katalu. And another one nicked. And again, they've lost the line out. The French in all sorts of trouble at their own line out. Fijians coming away with the ball. Uh, and then the frustrating thing was that we used to do up to 80, 100 scrums because I knew that every team in the world was going to target Fiji's scrum. 
in the World Cup because we were not known for scrumming. We're not used to scrumming. So we worked and worked and worked. And then what happened in that French game when we, they had five metre scrums on our line and it was packed, I think, four or five times and they couldn't budge us. Paddy O'Brien panicked and, and gave a penalty try against us because he couldn't believe, well, no, none of the world could believe that the Fiji scrum could hold the French. And then the second thing was a forward pass on their try. Third thing was Seta Tawaki, tackled and player, French player, who dropped the ball. He picked it up and scored. And they ruled it a knock on by Seta. Um, yeah, it was, it was a shocking piece of refereeing. And, and unfortunately, it was the end of us. But um, in his book later on, Paddy O'Brien. Yes. admitted that he that was the worst game he ever had in his life mm -hmm. and he considered retiring from refereeing after that. Wow. But that didn't help us. No, no, no. <laughs> because the next game, the yes. French got up and beat the All Blacks. Oh. And they wouldn't have even been there yes. had we continued. There would have been us playing the All Blacks. Wow. Yeah. But it was a wonderful tour. We, yes. we had uh, a great build-up. We, yes. we toured Italy. Early, I, I'd been a coach of a club in Italy and yes. I had contacts there and, yes. mm -hmm. and arranged a uh, tour where there was a, a tournament between international teams. Mm -hmm. We ended up in the final against yes. Italy and mm -hmm. it was a build-up. We brought all our players together from different parts of the world. We stayed together, we travelled together mm -hmm. and we built a nucleus that just moved us forward towards the World Cup. You know, Then we had a magnificent game against... Samoa at, at Suva, yes. mm -hmm. where we hammered them. Um, prob probably yes. our most correct game that I ever had yes. as a coach with Fiji. We, we just hammered them yes. mm -hmm. forwards and backs. It was, wow. it was absolutely mm -hmm. magnificent. Yes. And um, that, yeah, from that we rolled on to the World Cup. Yes. So everybody was positive. Yes. Everybody was, were, we were family. We weren't just a team. Yes, yes. We were playing for each other. We uh, we created this environment. Uh, yes. We had Raju Mali Kurosaru who who looked after the traditional side of the team. Yes. Um, Amy Tawaki, the yes. religious side of the team. Yes. We had all avenues covered. Yes. That that is different from our rugby, yes. but it is important in Fijian rugby. Uh, like you specifically mentioned uh, in one of the quotations that there was not a single rotten apple in the bunch. That, exactly. <laughs> there wasn't. And they all played for each other. Yes. If they didn't get picked, they worked hard and as reserves, running water, helping the injured, yes. you know, helping at training. Um, and we had situations where we could one player could get injured and we could replace it, could replace him with somebody else wow. who would take his place and, and, and not feel out of the mm -hmm. out of the group, you know. Mm -hmm. It was great, mm -hmm. really special. Uh, I'd love to ask you about one of my favourite players, uh, Manas Mbari. <laughs> yeah, Manas Mbari was mm -hmm. totally underrated. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, the first time I saw Manasa play outstandingly was we, we went to the Ballymore Tens. Yes, I remember that. And Manasa mm -hmm. just ripped the whole tournament apart. Mm -hmm. He had people oh. running around the circles. Yeah. He, he just killed them. Yeah. And um, yeah, he was an outstanding football uh, player. I, I've been, I remember watching the, some of the games, but I can't find the footage anywhere. Uh, I, I remember he... Um, someone kicked or he kicked and uh, scored and they ruled that he must have been ahead of the uh, because yeah, he was so fast. So fast. Yeah. No, exactly. <laughs> no, he was quite a um, shortest thick set build yeah. and he had strong hips yeah. mm -hmm. and he was very far, very similar to Brian Williams and, and mm -hmm. physique, physique yeah. but he had magnificent legs and yeah. speed, you know, I mean Low centre um, of gravity. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah no, I, uh, unfortunately, he, his period at the top wasn't as long as I would have liked to have been. But um, no, he was a superb. He came down to New Zealand and got a bit lost and, and lost his way, um, as some players do from Fiji. Um, not just New Zealand, but yeah. it's very hard when they move out of the Matangali yeah. and that support group that they're used to living with and. Yeah. 
um, and then going into a foreign country where they're on their own and they have to make decisions for themselves and there's very little support. Um, some boys lose their way and un unfortunately Manasa did. Yeah. Uh, are there any other players that uh, really stand out uh, for you from that era? Well, Greg Smith was a, a great captain and leader for that period. Um, he was a nuggety little fellow and he, he never stopped trying. He led by example, obviously. He, uh, yeah, no, he, he was... We also, obviously, Joey Vendieri, but I only had him for the first year I was there and then he disappeared. Um, he was he was a terrific... We had some great talented players. Uh, Satala, centre, you know, was, was outstanding. The Raluni brothers at halfback, they... Both of them had their own strengths and mm -hmm. were, were, were great for the team. Um, Alfred Ulinao? <laughs> Alfie, yeah, Alfie was very tidy. Okay. Very tidy player, very smart player. Mm -hmm. And he'd come out of the Ponsonby grades and, and, and growing up. In fact, I played here with his father yeah. okay. at North Shore. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, Alfie was, was, I mean, we had special players all over the field, really. And I mean Simon Roy Louis, who was, who was an engine I mean, in the was team. Huge. I was just looking at his stats. Yeah, it was 130, 120 yeah. odd cages. I mean, he'd be. Yeah. He'd not but be he hard. held our scrum together. You see, right. <laughs> he wasn't quite. He wasn't the uh, six foot eight like some of them were, or six right. foot sevens. Yeah. But he was. But he was the, the motor in the scrum, and he held that together. You know, and um, that's very important. Of course, we had characters. I mean, <laughs> you know, um, Joe Vidiaki, yeah. um, Bill Thambati. They were the two biggest props in world rugby at that stage. 137. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and it was a constant battle for me to keep them both fit enough to, yeah. to play at that level. But they were great guys, and yeah. they were good for the team. Yeah. Um, really, really something special. Wonderful. Now, uh, outside of uh, Fiji rugby, um, Peter Fatulofa, <laughs> could, could you tell us uh, more about your association with him? <laughs> yeah, well, Pete, Pete started playing for Ponsonby at the end of my career when I was just finishing with North Shore. Yep. <laughs> and we marked each other in those days, and he was just a, a rugged yep. little yep. island boy that yep. tried like hell and, yep. and was totally enthusiastic yep. and... Yep. and and very good, and he developed over time. Yeah. And then he, he probably became the icon of Pacific rugby yes. throughout his career. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And my great friendship with Brian Williams yeah. also associated me with Peter, yes. Peter Fats, yeah. who was really a character. Yeah. And, and uh, <laughs> no, he, he was a special player, and he, he, uh, he gave a huge amount mm -hmm. to Ireland, not just Samoan rugby, but to yeah. all Ireland rugby. Mm -hmm. Not counting Ponsonby and, yeah. and Auckland and you know um, the rugby played down here. Um, big big family man, yes. big man, yes. and uh, it was just a great shock when he passed so quickly. I went to his funeral. It was a very sad occasion. In Palmerston North, uh, the Samoans that I know there, and uh, younger people, I uh, tell you, do you know Peter Fatulofa? Immediately they know who I'm talking about. And these are like, you know, people in their 20s yeah, and so exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, uh, exactly. No, he, um, he, was, he was something special. Great humour. You know, very... In fact, the last game he played for Manu Samoa was that game I was talking about it in Suva, where we hammered them. Yes. And it was a sad day for him because it, it was his last outing yeah. mm -hmm. and he was getting a bit long in the tooth by then. <laughs> but, um, yeah, uh, it was just one of those days. Speaking of another player that uh, yeah, we must speak about is Marika von Imbaka. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, Marika, <laughs> Marika obviously was an outstanding sevens player also. Right. And his aggression and speed in the 15s game um, made him special in, in the 15s game it made him um, stand out he went to I think it was Leicester in England and had a professional career for a while um, he, he was a great finisher you know he always had the outside swerve the outside and he, he was so aggressive a lot of Wingers in those days didn't have the ability to stop them. I, I, I'm very surprised you're uh, speaking about aggression because I thought you'd be speaking about speed. <laughs> well, he had speed too, but aggression, yeah. you can't just survive on speed. 
you know, um, it's all right to, to get half around the person, but if you've got the aggression to push them off at the same time as you're going around them, then you, you can finish the job. And, and on regular occasions, he was able to do that. So, for young Pacific Island rugby players in Fiji and Samoa and Tonga, what advice would you give them? Like someone who's aspiring to be a professional rugby player and they're in the islands and uh, not much resources and so on. I mean, what would you suggest? Well, it's, nothing really has changed greatly from even when I was there. Uh, facilities aren't great in some of the areas. and So the individual has to work, be very disciplined and work very hard himself. Um, he's got to learn that the training you do off the field is probably twofold to the time you spend on the field. And when I arrived in Fiji, it was the opposite. Players gave 100% at, uh, at the game situation, but <laughs> not a lot of the time was put into weights, for instance, to gain strength. The, the, the central core wasn't strong. The legs were great in those days, but it's to have a balance throughout. Legs, central core, upper body, and um, just, they've, they've just got to become athletes of, of exceptional strength. In terms of your career right now, um, what are you doing? What uh, do you spend your time? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm the president of my old club, North Shore. I started here when I'm f I was five, and I'm now 69 nearly, <laughs> and I'm still here. Yes. But um, mm -hmm. that's, that's, and my granddaughter's playing here. Yeah. We've got uh, mm -hmm. 470 kids playing in the club at the moment, so... Mm -hmm. That's pretty special. Um, yeah, I've still got an involvement, but to be honest, it's 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 not like it used to be. Obviously, you can't go forever, and um, I enjoy my club rugby as much as I enjoy any other rugby. You know, the All Blacks and the club are probably the I love going to both. Um, but you know, I still follow every all rugby. I follow the Fijian sides. So I watch everything really. I just love the game. Awesome. But are there some particular teams right now or players that are really standing out for you? Well, the, the teams, I don't look individually because to my mind the game is a 26-man game and uh, teams that work systems and have discipline and, and have the ability to, to create something out of nothing are the special teams to my mind. and. Um, this World Cup coming up, to my mind, is going to be the, the, the one that is going to throw up more challenges to the All Blacks than any other one we've been to, I believe. Um, England are strong, Ireland are strong, Wales are strong, South Africa, and even Australia, who are going through a bit of a problem at the moment, but they're still, if you take their top 26 players, they've got a very strong team. Um, so on the day, it's going to come back to those who can take the pressure, mm -hmm. those who have the least injuries to key positions, mm -hmm. um, and those who can lift to the final, because it, it's a different animal, that final. Totally different. So, like, uh, speaking of the All Blacks, what would you say are the one or two differentiating factors, uh, like, you know, the All Blacks compared to other teams? Uh? I think they, they um, chance their arm more, although that's changing in the world of rugby. I think they play a 80% attacking system, where you might find England plays a 80% defensive system. Um, and it's going to be interesting the two different structures that, that come through because their, their defensive line that comes forward uh, is, is very hard to break down, very hard to stop. The All Blacks have got to f create pressure and keep things moving fast. If the Northern Hemisphere teams can slow down the second and third phase ball, uh, it's going to be very diff difficult for the All Black backs to break the line. Um, but in saying that, uh, I still have faith that they, had, they do have that ability and I still hope that the referees watch the offside line because many of these defensive systems are built on a, a line that's half a metre in front of the hind foot rather than behind the hind foot, which can change the whole run of a game. 
Um, but it, you know, I'm not saying they're, they're a cert because they're not, because this time, as I say, many of those teams, any one of them could win. Oh, much for your time. <laughs> no, not yeah. at all. Oh, so, uh, like, you know, in terms of Fiji, you still visit and keep in touch and... Yeah, I've still got a house in Fiji and I, I'm on Malolo Levu and I go up once or twice a year and I, I love the place. I still, I would still be living there, but I have grandkids and older parents and things that we... Family comes first, obviously, yes. these days, but... Um, yeah, I left half my heart in Fiji. It's still there, and and I regularly think about it. And, and I'm in contact not only with my players, still, yes. mm -hmm. but many of the staff. I, I I built a little resort called Funky Fish up there, and mm -hmm. um, I'm still involved with some of the staff from the from those days. And awesome. uh, mm -hmm. yeah, no, I it, I love the place. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> Fiji is indebted to you. Yeah, no. <laughs> well, well, you. you get back what you put in, and I, I got a lot back. The North Shore Fiji Army team. Yes. Mm -hmm. And in the 1960s, in the local army base, there was a, a platoon, I whatever you call them, of, of Fijian army men that came down for a couple of years. Uh, and it was a rotating thing, probably over eight years. Okay. And they played here mm -hmm. in our club. They were known as North Shore Army, mm -hmm. and they won their championship in the second grade. Um, awesome. In those days. Pretty, oh. Very special. Loved by all. Oh, they awesome. Were, um, they had a, a star player, a man by the name of Peter Calavati. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. And he, uh, yeah, they, they were a special. Ram Booker. Oh, he was in the team. Yes. Not that one there, but yes. he was. He did play here. Yes. In the day. Mm. Yes. On the end, we have a man, Murray Jones, who yep. was an all-black prop. Yep. Mm -hmm. And played at this club. Grew up at this place. Bruce Cameron was a junior all-black halfback mm -hmm. and also a New Zealand weightlifter and got a, a, a gold medal at the yep. Commonwealth Games. Mm -hmm. Don Mackay scored a try against the Springboks. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, myself, uh, played five seasons for the All Blacks. Yes. Mm -hmm. Gary Cunningham, who assisted me with Fiji, yes. the back coach. Yes. Buck Shelford, yes. that we all know, yes. one of the best players in New Zealand history. Wow. Brian O'Bodica. Yep. Mm -hmm. Brian played both rugby international and league. Yes. Um, Paul McGann was a halfback. Yes. Played in for North Shore. Robert Todd uh, played for the under-21s. He was yeah. also, he was a centre and he also mm -hmm. coached Gloucester and played at Gloucester. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The rest is sort of below yeah. that. You know. yeah. um, <laughs> coached at the same time, yeah. Yeah. but the focus is on fun. Yeah. It's on, you know, the kids enjoying themselves. It's not so much about winning and losing. It. Um, we just want kids to enjoy themselves and have an experience where they, they remember, you know. I started down here at five and I've still got friends who I played that first year from that team, you know, um, around the area. The jerseys, yes. uh, inside out jerseys, the white oh, team, okay. oh, that you can roll them through. So oh, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's smart. <laughs>